Good morning to everyone. Uh, uh, if you don't know me, I'm uh, Ernesto Otero. I'm a professor of ophthalmology at the uh, Superior School of Ophthalmology of the Barraker Institute of America. Today, we're going to talk about the surgical approach uh, to pediatric uh, cataracts. And uh, the reason I chose this uh, webinar is because, with this presentation, is because uh, many of us, uh, at least it happens in my practice, uh, we have to uh, encounter uh, pediatric patients. And uh, at least in the setting where I work at, uh, there's a philosophy that it is better for um, cataract surgeons or, or experienced cataract surgeons to manage pediatric cataracts as opposed as pediatric surgeons, because pediatric surgeons uh, or pediatric ophthalmologists they tend to, uh, to specialize, again, in strabismus and other types of surgery and seldomly see uh, pediatric cataracts. And, and pediatric cataracts have, you know, you have to um, uh, know them and know how to approach them for them to be uh, successful. So uh, the reason I'm, I'm doing this is because I know many of you sometimes have to, to, uh, to treat these patients, and I think it's a good idea to know uh, how to do them and how to uh, uh, manage them. These are my financial disclosures. Uh, none of them are related to this presentation. So there are various crystalline lens abnormalities in children. We can have uh, congenital cataracts. We can have uh, also structural abnormalities of the lens or position abnormalities of the crystalline lens uh, which include congenital aphakia, a spherophakia, crystalline lens coloboma, and obviously uh, ectopia uh, lentis. These are two examples of the one is an ectopia lentis patient, which we see uh, clinically a, 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 a shifted crystalline lens when we dilate the pupils. Generally, these, these patients are uh, clinically, you'll find that, uh, that dilate poorly. Uh, sometimes it, it's tough to examine, examine them, and in very young children, um, we might need to do a, 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 an exam under a general anesthesia. So what we see uh, basically is uh, we can observe, like in this ectopia lentis patient, we can observe the edge of the lens uh, that's shifted, or in this other case of uh, spherophakia, we'll see the, the, the complete uh, equator uh, of the crystalline lens. And again, these are associated to uh, different pathologies. Uh, lenticular abnormalities in children uh, have an incidence of about one in 4,000 to one in 10,000 newborn babies uh, worldwide. And of them, pediatric cataracts compromise the 10% uh, of, those, of those patients. Uh, pediatric cataracts can be isolated or associated with systemic disease. They can be acquired or congenital. They can be hereditary or sporadic. They could be unilateral or bilateral. They can be total or complete, uh, stable or progressive. And there are various etiologies for uh, pediatric cataracts. Uh, it, it's a good idea to classify them if they're bilateral or unilateral because, again, the causes can be uh, different. Bilateral cataracts uh, can occur idiopathically, just out of the blue. They can be hereditary or familial. Usually, they're uh, autosomal dominant, uh, also X-linked, and rarely autosomal recessive. They could be uh, related to a chromosomal abnormality like Down syndrome or uh, uh, trisomy 13, trisomy 18, uh, other translocations or deletions and duplications of the chromosomes can produce um, pediatric cataracts. Craniofacial syndromes like hallerman strife syndrome, Rubenstein-Tybee, smith lemel optics or others. Musculoskeletal uh, uh, disorders like Albright syndrome, conradi humerman syndrome, and myotonic dystrophy. Renal syndromes like Alpert syndrome and Lowe syndrome metabolic diseases um, like uh, cerebral tendinous exantomatosis, diabetes mellitus, Fabry's disease, galactosemia, manosidosis, and Wilson disease. 
after intrauterine, uh, intrauterine infections like cytomegalovirus, rubella, syphilis, toxoplomosis, and varicella, ocular abnormalities like aniridia or um, anterior segment uh, dysgenesis, and iatrogenic, as in corticosteroid uh, use and radiation exposures. And unilateral cat cataracts can also be idiopathic and can be associated to ocular anomalies like persistent fetal vasculature, uh, posterior lenticanus, lentiglobus, um, posterior segment tumors, uh, retinal detachment from any causes or coloboma, traumatic, and or radiation exposure. So we should always, when evaluating uh, congenital uh, pediatric cataracts, uh, always look if they're associated to, to, to other abnormalities, as I said, such as persistent primary vasculature. Uh, what we'll see is they're generally uh, posterior cataracts that, that, uh, that they look like subcapsular, but uh, it basically compromise a larger portion of the uh, posterior capsule. They could be associated to, to Peter's syndrome or axon van Rieger syndrome, to aniridia or retinal disorders, as we said, saw uh, like coloboma or retinal detachment. They can be congenital or acquired. Congenital, basically, uh, we see them at birth uh, and uh, infantile during the first year. Uh, acquired, again, we see them, uh, we tend to see them later in life. And the prognosis varies uh, uh, if, if, if uh, uh, children present with uh, cataracts at a very early age, before two to three months, and they're not, not diagnosed at an early stage, the prognosis is worse than if they're diagnosed uh, at birth um, and or if they appear at a later age. Also, unilateral cataracts tend to have a worse prognosis than um, bilateral cataracts. Generally, and this is very important to, to, to assess and to, to convey to the parents that if, again, if they've if they appear early in life, the prognosis is going to be uh, worse, especially if they, have, they haven't been treated before the first four months uh, of age. There was a study uh, many, many years ago uh, with baboons in which they occluded the eyes of newborn baboons uh, uh, completely, and uh, they became, uh, if, if they weren't uh, uh, de-occluded before the first four months, then they would become uh, profoundly amblyopic. And that is the reason why the prognosis in terms of visual rehabilitation uh, uh, is, is worse. So here we see uh, in this image, a congenital um, a nuclear progressive cataract. As we can see, we don't see the edge of the, uh, of the crystal lens, but we see the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, embryonary uh, nucleus, uh, which has uh, become uh, cloudy. Uh, ectopia lentis uh, is associated with uh, uh, different uh, conditions, uh, systemic like Marfan syndrome, like homocystinuria, like Wilmarchisani syndrome, or, or sulfide oxidase deficiency. Uh, generally, the difference between Marfan and Wilmarchisani, uh, they're completely opposite. Uh, patients in, with Marfan syndrome, they're, they're very uh, tall, they have long extremities, and they have hyper uh, extensive. Uh, Articula uh, articulations, uh, whereas well Marchesani syndrome, they're very short in stature. Um, uh, they're kind of small and bulky, and if you grab their hands, they, it, it feels like a log. Uh, so those are things that can guide us into the uh, diagnosis. Uh, associated with ocular conditions, uh, an iridia uh, can, can present itself with ectopulentis. It is not uh, what we commonly find, generally, uh, uh, children with aniridia will develop more of a subcapsular uh, cataract. Um, and, and, and sometimes, because especially if there's a, a total aniridia, we, cannot, we can see the edge of the, uh, of, or the equator of the crystalline lens. And uh, that might us, uh, induce us to, to feel that it is uh, an ectopulentis. But generally, they have subcapsular cataracts. Iris coloboma. Um, associated also with, uh, with uh, ectopulentis, um, more so if there's a lack of zonule in the inferior portion where the coloboma uh, is located. Sometimes we have a good zonule and there's just a coloboma of some of the, uh, of the zonule uh, fi uh, fibers and, and we, we can see like a wedge uh, in the equator without uh, the lens being uh, actually shifted. 
traumatic uh, uh, cataracts produce ectopilentes, and uh, as we saw, uh, patients with megalocornea, so very large eyes, can have uh, associated solar uh, zonal weakness. There's a, a, heren her a, a bilateral hereditary uh, subluxation of the lens in a seven-year-old uh, boy, which we're going to see uh, his surgery in the future. There's always the question when we uh, approach these patients if we should implant or not uh, an intraocular lens. And I would say that depends on the age of the child and the uh, laterality uh, of the cataract. So it's generally accepted that children between one and two years are eligible for in intraocular lens implantation. Um, younger patients um, is not recommended as they tend to have uh, higher complications if the lens is implanted. Generally, uh, if, if we implant a lens in children uh, under the 12 months of age, uh, we, there's an association with higher incidence of complications, uh, especially glaucoma and retinal detachment and a, a greater uh, refractive change, uh, myopia. With, with age. Uh, even if we compensate for the growth of the eye, it's been observed and there was a, a published paper around 2006 in ophthalmology which evaluated uh, long-term uh, follow-up uh, in children and uh, they saw that uh, having an intraocular lens implantation was associated with all these uh, complications. Uh, and if we leave these children uh, under the 12 months of age, uh, a fake it is very important to start a visual rehabilitation immediately, either with soft contact lenses, uh, and we have to train the parents on how to uh, uh, place the contact lens in the eye of the children, uh, how to remove them uh, at night, uh, and again, to prevent them from having contact lens associated uh, complications. Or uh, you can uh, adapt them with uh, eyeglasses. Uh, generally, they're very high powered, positive. Uh, eyeglasses, and obviously start uh, occlusion at a very uh, young age. Uh, in my practice, what, what I do or what we do is generally these patients are referred to me by the uh, pediatric uh, ophthalmologist, and um, I, I, I treat the cataract, and then I send them uh, a week uh, after surgery back to them so they start uh, the visual rehabilitation, either with pleoptic exercises and or occlusion, and the adaptation of contact lenses or um, of glasses. After the first uh, year of age, uh, we can uh, implant an intraocular lens. Um, here, it's very important that uh, we implant the lens uh, in the sac. Uh, we have to calculate the lens um, uh, uh, accounting for the uh, uh, increase in actual length that happens uh, in children over time. Remember these children, when they're born, they have around 19 millimeters of actual length uh, between 19 to 20, and they'll grow up to, to uh, about 23 uh, millimeters in a normal eye. So we have to account for that change uh, over time. If we leave them uh, anotropic, they'll become very rapidly uh, myopic. So we have to uh, account for that. Uh, the younger the child, the higher the hyperopic re refraction should be aimed at. And when you have a unilateral cataract, again, it's not a good idea to leave the, the patient with a high hyperopic defect because that will generate anisometropia and that will generate uh, amblyopia. So a rule of thumb, what I try to do in these patients with unilateral cataracts is uh, to aim for the physiologic uh, um, uh, hyperopia that they should have. And more or less is at one year of age, uh, leave them around three diopters of hyperopia. At two years of age, leave them at two diopters of hyperopia. And at three years of age, leave them around one diopter of hyperopia. We can aim a little bit higher just to try to compensate and not having a lot of anisometropia. And, and, and again, uh, my experience that is over time, that eye tends to become myopic. Uh, but again, we have to um, juggle with the idea that we don't want them to be uh, a very amblyopic. We need to rehabilitate uh, these patients. The downside is that these patients, as I said uh, initially, by having a unilateral, unilateral cataract, 
they tend to uh, to um, have a worse prognosis because they, uh, when we end up doing uh, cataract surgery for them, it's at around one year of age or one and a half. So they've been, they've already become amblyopic, and and trying to bring them back from from that amblyopia is is tough. What formulas should we use? Uh, generally, formulas that are that are uh, that behave uh, very very well with uh, uh, shorter eyes. Uh, with these, uh, basically, Hagis is a good formula. Uh, Barrett Universal Two is a, a good for formula, uh, and uh, Hoffer uh, Q is a, a, a good uh, formula for shorter eyes. So those are the formulas that we that we have to use. Sometimes it's tough to measure these these, these uh, patients. Uh, what I like to do is that they're very young. They tend not to collaborate uh, to have them measured at the um, at uh, an inter interferometry based um, biometer. So what we have to do is uh, anesthetize the patient. Once they're anesthetized, uh, we have a portable uh, uh, keratometer or a portable uh, uh, topographer that we can that we can measure them uh, in the OR to to take into account for the uh, keratometry. Remember also that these children have a very steep keratometry, keratometry when they're born, and the keratometry tends to decrease in power within the first uh, 10 to 12 years of age. So their keratometry change, changes over time. Uh, and, and again, we have to uh, also uh, account for that. And we can use an ultrasound biometer to measure them intraoperatively and then calculate the lens that we're going to implant. Uh, there's this um, uh, nomogram that I um, that I found, uh, which is uh, the different power or the residual refraction that we should aim, uh, depending on the age of the child. Again, when they're very young, uh, 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 10 diopters. But I, as I said, we tend not to implant the lens at such a young age because it's associated uh, with with uh, higher complications. Uh, but generally, after one to two years of age, of plus six, plus five, plus four, plus three, and and so on. So this is a a great a good way of 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 of, of calculating prevalence. So the approach that I that I that I do for pediatric cataracts is also based on the age of the uh, child, and the surgical technique should vary based on what we're going to do. So in patients that are uh, younger than one. Uh, uh, then 12 months, generally what we'll do is aspirate the cataract. So here, and I'm going to pause the video uh, for a second, uh, here we can see that the a child has a nuclear or an embryonary uh, cataract uh, with a, a, this patient had a, a bilateral cataract. So, so what happens with such young, or what are the considerations with such uh, young uh, children? And, and the first consideration I would, uh, I would recommend is that we want to make a very small incision. We're not going to implant an intraocular lens, so we don't need to do a, a, a larger incision. These cataracts are mostly, we can aspirate them, so we're able to do them with a 1.2 millimeter incision. And that has certain advantages, is that we don't have to remove stitches, we don't have to place stitches, um, uh, after surgery, uh, so that avoids the patient coming in to the OR and re and being re-anesthetized to the removal of uh, of the suture. So what I like to do with these patients is do a, a, a two 1.2 uh, millimeter incisions, um, uh, generally at 11 and uh, two or three o'clock. Uh, I'll stain the anterior capsule, and as as you can see. This is something that uh, sometimes complicates cataracts uh, surgery in children is that they tend to uh, their eyes tend to shift upwards even if they're uh, even th though if uh, they're deeply anesthetized. So ha grabbing it with a second instrument to pull down the eye uh, and do it. Uh, Capsulorexis uh, we can do it through the 1.2 millimeter incision. Uh, generally, I use a uh, a um, uh, a bent needle or a cystitome. And then I use these uh, uh, forceps, which are the serrata uh, forceps uh, for retinal surgery. They're 23 gauge uh, forceps. 
and they can go in through my 1.2 millimeter incision. And as you can see, the anterior capsule of children are highly elastic. So what we have to do with, uh, with the capsule rexes in uh, children is try to uh, aim for a smaller rexis than what's intended because they tend to enlarge. And I think this is the biggest uh, challenge, uh, how they enlarge. Uh, it's uh, because we're having a closed, a very closed uh, um, uh, anterior chamber. Again, don't hydrodissect all that much. They don't need hydrodissection. They're very soft cataracts, as you can see, and they can be aspirated with a bimanual technique. These are two uh, Borato forceps, and uh, again, they're easily aspirated. Sometimes you'll encounter a, a little bit of, of, of calcification of the cataract, and you just you know gently uh, again macerate it against the uh, tip of the uh, of the forceps. So so as as you can see, it is a very I apologize. It's a it's a very uh, straightforward uh, 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 procedure. Let me go back here. Here we were. So it's a very uh, straightforward um, uh, aspiration. Uh, the other uh, important aspect of pediatric cataracts is that uh, the uh, endothelial um, cap, uh, uh, crystalline cells that are in the equator, they're very young, very aggressive, and they tend to uh, uh, proliferate very rapidly and opacify the posterior capsule. And that is a huge challenge with children because it's very difficult to do a capsulotomy, a laser capsulotomy. They develop uh, these very thick, Elchinic uh, pearls uh, in the posterior capsule and doing capsulotomy uh, is, is, is difficult. So it's always uh, uh, advised to do a posterior capsule erexis. Um, uh, generally, the posterior capsule behaves like the anterior capsule. Uh, what you do is stain it with a trip and blue as we did the anterior capsule, then go in with a cystotome, make a little opening. And what I like to do is put some dispersive viscoelastic separating the anterior hyaloid membrane from, from uh, the posterior capsule. And then I'll go in and with my uh, serrata forceps, I'll do a posterior capsule erexis. Uh, generally, what we wanna do is around four millimeters as I said, it is it is uh, it behaves more so like the anterior capsule of an adult with a little bit of elasticity uh, again. But remember, this is going to close, so we we we, we don't want to uh, we we don't want it uh, again to be small. If it closes, it doesn't matter. When the when the child grows older, we'll generally uh, place a lens uh, uh, in the uh, sulcus. And the other thing that's very important is. The iris in children is uh, very, very uh, inflammatory, I would say. So it is always a good idea or a good recommendation to do, to do a peripheral iridotomy. Uh, as you saw, I do it with, uh, with the uh, um, with a 1.2 millimeter um, uh, uh, blade. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a vertical incision at the limbus. Uh, here we, we see that I'm, I, I do it with a with a 1.2 mm, the same 1.2 millimeter blade uh, until I go into the um, into the iris, and then I'll grasp it with my serrata forceps and do a small peripheral iridotomy. The reason why we do this is because uh, children tend to develop synechiae uh, uh, more readily, and we want to have again. Um, a bypass for the aqueous treatment to go into the anterior chamber, and that will prevent the development of uh, secondary glaucoma uh, and, and further complications. So what do I do when children are greater than a, a year of age? Uh, I What I do is I know I'm gonna place a lens in inside of these, uh, of these children, so the technique has to be different. Uh, I, although uh, it's similar to uh, the technique uh, in, in children uh, younger than one age, what I'll, what I'll do is uh, I'll uh, do a superior peridomy uh, with the Westcott scissors, not too large, around uh, uh, 2.5 or 2.4 uh, millimeters 
uh, in, in length. Then I'll, with a crescent, I'll create a, a, a scleral under, you know, slightly behind the limbus, I'll create a scleral tunnel uh, until I go into the, into the uh, clear cornea. Uh, again, I want this to be a self-sealing incision. Um, and without going to a tear chamber, I'll just proceed as I did with uh, the cataract of, of, of uh, young children uh, under one year of age. I'll stain the anterior capsule with uh, driven blue. I'll use uh, uh, dispersive and cohesive uh, viscoelastic. And then I'll, I'll do through my 1.2 millimeter uh, incision with a cystotome or a 26 gauge needle. I'll start my my rexis. Uh, sometimes it's difficult because they don't have such a, a good red, red reflex. That's why it's important to use uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, trip and blue. And as I said, generally try to aim for a smaller rexis because they tend to be very elastic and tend to uh, expand. Uh, and, uh, sometimes if it's, if it's hard to, to keep the eye uh, in place, uh, use some traction sutures. Uh, and here you can see, although I started uh, um, small, uh, I had to uh, basically increase the, the diameter uh, because it was too small. And, and in the uh, superior portion, it tended to go uh, slightly uh, or more peripheral than, 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 than I wanted. Uh, again, it's, it, it's very controlled. You don't want to do it very fast. Uh, expanding it, it's easier because you just pull it uh, farther away from the uh, from uh, from the edge of the rexus, and that will increase the size of the uh, of the rexus. As I said, it's tough because that sometimes there's not good enough a red reflex to do, and and as I said also, uh, very little hydrodissection. You don't want to put a lot of liquid. Again, it, we have a self sealing wounds and a closed anterior chamber, so we don't want to put a lot of pressure in it. And then just go in, aspirate uh, the cataract, uh, uh, then the cortex, very uh, straightforward case. Uh, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's always a, a the, the big question, especially in younger children, if we're going to leave them a fakic, a fakic, if uh, if it's a, a good idea to keep the uh, both leaflets of the of the rexis open. Uh, recently, about a year ago, I see I saw a device that uh, could be placed. Uh, it's like a silicone device that goes in the bag and keeps the bag open, prevents it from 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 self sealing, and uh, and it's recommended uh, for patients that that you're not able to 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 place a lens and you want to keep the capsular uh, bag open or the two leaflets open. And I think it could be um, a, a good idea. Uh, in, especially in young children, if we want to implant a secondary IOL in the back uh, at a later, uh, a little bit later age. But again, if, if those leaflets close, that's actually an advantage because that would prevent the migration of the uh, uh, endothelial crystalline lens cells uh, uh, into the um, anterior, uh, anterior hyloid, uh, and, 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 and that's a, a good idea. So here, uh, what we'll do is uh, now uh, 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 fill in the uh, the capsular bag with uh, with uh, uh, viscoelastic and uh, go in and place the lens uh, in the bag. Uh, this is uh, when uh, children are older. For example, over four years of age. This is what I'll do because I know I can I can do a posterior capsular rexis. Uh, the other option is to do a posterior capsular rexis. Uh, uh, at the same time and place the lens uh, uh, in the bag and then trap the optic, do a, 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 an optic capture. Uh, and generally, you can do it uh, shifting the optic towards the vitreous cavity and, and trapping the optic, or you can do an anterior uh, optic capture uh, in which you uh, basically move the optic towards uh, 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 through the anterior rexus and capture it. That has the advantage of of, of sealing the, the anterior posterior capsule and preventing um, the, uh, the endothelial cells to migrate and opacify 
the um, deposphere capsule. Generally, when children are older than four years of age, then you can place it and do a yak capsule lobotomy uh, in the future. And as you saw, by using a cell sealing wound, uh, uh, I don't have to uh, put place a stitch. I'll just put it, uh, place a seven O um, vicral suture, uh, closing the uh, conjunctiva, and it'll reabsorb. And again, the patient will be uh, uh, comfortable. There are other conditions uh, like this one in which we have a Marfan syndrome in older patients. This is a this was a fourteen year old. A uh, patient with a uh, Marfan syndrome and uh, ectopia lentis. Uh, so here um, uh, we have uh, basically, or we can approach these uh, in one of two ways, uh, in, in in my view. So the first is uh, uh, removing the uh, the crystalline lens. Uh, uh, I know a lot of you feel more comfortable if you refer to a retinologist for them to. To, to remove the lens. Uh, I like to do them uh, myself. Uh, obviously, before we, we do um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the crystalline extract, uh, extraction or aspiration, it's very important in this space that you refer them to a retinologist, make sure that the retina is uh, healthy, that there are no uh, lattice cracks or perforations, and if there are, they should be treated. Also, these patients should be referred back to the retinologist uh, immediately after surgery to make sure that there are no tears or breaks because Marfan syndrome patients or topulentis patients have high, high, higher incidence of uh, retinal uh, detachment. So the procedure uh, is basically the same. Um, we can stain the capsule, the intercapsule. My, my current approach is, this is a very old video from 2014, but my current approach with this is I don't stain them. And the reason I don't stain them is because as you can see, although it allows me to evaluate uh, in a much better way or see in a much better way the, the, uh, the anterior capsule, it prevents, it also stains the anterior hyaline. So it decreases the red reflex and that uh, uh, makes it a little bit difficult uh, to, uh, to do the rexis and see what's going on with the anterior structures. So these capsules, are, this is probably the toughest part to do a rexis. We don't need to do a very large rexis. We just need to have a, a, an opening to uh, be able uh, to center the lens and remove the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cortex and the nucleus through that opening through aspiration. Because they are very elastic capsules, they basically uh, suddenly radiate. So we can use iris hooks like I'm using uh, in this patient. Uh, you can use iris hooks to bring the, the whole um, uh, uh, lens towards the center. And then you can go in and aspirate it. Uh, you can use the phaco tip. Yes, if you have a large, you have a large incision, or you could do them as I did with the other uh, the patients. Uh, you can just uh, aspirate it by manually. Uh, using uh, either Barada forceps. This is a, a, a 20 uh, uh, gauge or 23 gauge uh, cannula uh, that uh, allows us to aspirate it. Um, sometimes uh, it's easier with a straight cannula as opposed to the Barada forceps because, again, we're occluding uh, with the cortex or the, the, or the lens material, the tip of the cannula, and aspirate it. Uh, uh, one of the challenges during this stage is that the, the posterior capsule, because there's no uh, sonar counter-traction, uh, so the, the capsule tends to come to the tip. Uh, so it's, it's a good idea to place the cannula uh, towards the uh, lens material and then aspirate, uh, and that way the, the, the capsule won't come uh, towards the tip. If, if it does, you know, putting some viscoelastic uh, will send the uh, capsule backwards and that allows us to have a complete uh, aspiration of the, uh, of the lens uh, uh, material. Uh, you can remove the capsule if you wish. Uh, I prefer to leave it in place. It'll basically retract and get away from, from, the, uh, from the optical axis. And back then, I was very um, keen since 2006 uh, to implant uh, these uh, artisan aphakia lenses, which are very 
uh, easy to implant. You can implant them um, uh, in the anterior chamber or uh, uh, in the posterior chamber, inverted. Um, uh, again, these are young children with very good endothelial cell counts with very deep chambers. So they work very well. Uh, nowadays, because they are young, I prefer to fixate a lens, a lens to the sclera, and we'll see that technique um, uh, in the future. I follow up this girl. I saw her, as a matter of fact, last week. Um, uh, she, when, when I implanted the lens, she was uh, plano. Um, she's become slightly uh, myopic. Her retina is healthy, and she has a subluxation of the of the in the other eye, but she still sees very well. So she wears. Uh, her contact lens uh, in, in the right eye, and she wears um, uh, a contact lens in, in the left eye, uh, and very happy uh, seeing very well. Generally, these patients with Marfan tend to have very good visions because the lens will, will subluxate over time, so, so they're able to develop uh, a good vision, uh, and, and again, the prognosis uh, is very good. And then uh, there's the, the ectopic lentis in, in, in younger patients. This patient is the seven-year-old that I showed you with a, a bilateral hereditary familial um, uh, uh, subluxation. Uh, so here, what, uh, what I also do is, again, the approach is very similar to, to, to that of the, of the Marfan syndrome, uh, but the difference uh, is that I've, uh, I'll fixate a lens to the uh, sclera. And when we saw uh, in our past webinar, uh, secondary IOLs uh, in fakia, again, learn a good technique for IOL fixation that'll help you uh, over time to manage uh, complications, capsule ruptures, and also these uh, uh, complex cases. As you saw, the eyes tend to go upward, so a traction suture uh, is a good idea. And then we do, uh, again, we don't want this patient to come into the OR, removing the stitches is, is, is tough, so we'll do a scleral tunnel, uh, and, uh, and then we'll create a couple of uh, uh, a two by two or three by three millimeter uh, scleral flaps, um, 180 degree, degrees uh, apart, um, and um, uh, where we're gonna fixate the haptics uh, of our lens. Uh, the procedure is the same as the one that you saw in the Marfan syndrome. Again, we do a, a small capsule erexis uh, to aspirate the lens. Again, the, the, the reason why I, I don't like to, uh, again, uh, I want to keep the lens and do it in the bag, a lot of you are gonna question yourself, is that if we don't interfere with the anterior hyaloid, if we don't have vitreous loss, again, that favors the prognosis uh, uh, of these patients. Uh, so the 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 least that the the, the the least that you go into the vitreous cavity or that you handle the vitreous. Remember that the vitreous uh, in these young patients is very strong. The strands are very very strong. So any traction that you generate can pull on the retina and create uh, retinal tears. Whereas if we put some visco uh, uh, dispersive viscoelastic, we'll basically uh, uh, push the vitreous towards uh, the vitreous cavity or, to, or push the anterior hyal hyaloid towards the vitreous cavity and that'll uh, prevent from having vitreous loss. We'll keep the anterior hyaloid uh, in place and that obviously has uh, a better prognosis uh, in, in these patients. So uh, the procedure is uh, basically the same. They tend to be aspirated here. Uh, it's a little bit tougher, especially where there's absence of, 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 the, of the zonule because the back tends to come towards the aspiration tip and uh, that uh, is compensated by put, uh, placing in more uh, cohesive viscoelastic into the capsular bag. Uh, as I said, you don't need to uh, hydrodissect or hydrodelineate. Uh, they're very um, easy uh, to aspirate. Uh, if you leave the bag and and uh, the bag is in the optical axis, I would recommend because these these are older children uh, doing a, uh, uh, a capsulotomy immediately uh, within a month after surgery. That'll prevent those uh, EC cells to progress uh, to the optical axis and make it uh, tougher. If you remove it, and, and here we're gonna see, you can do 
um, uh, with the detector through the uh, uh, sclerotomy that you're going to see that I'm going to create. You can do, you can remove uh, the back. So once uh, we've created the, 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 the flaps, we uh, created a little tunnel with a bent 26 gauge uh, needle. That's where our haplics are going to be uh, inserted. Uh, uh, so if we create it, we create it uh, in, in both sides uh, uh, based on the orientation of the, of the haptics. Uh, I like to stain it a little bit so I, I can find the tunnel easier. And then I'll go in with a VLANS uh, 23 gauge uh, sclerotome uh, at two millimeters from the limbus. And as you can see, I always measure the distance uh, and then uh, we'll increase the size of our, of our uh, incision to 3.2 uh, millimeters. Uh, and then I'll go in and place a three uh, piece uh, IOL. Uh, uh, you can do it as I'm doing it over here, implant putting in, in the anterior chamber. Uh, uh, and then uh, we'll ex exteriorize the haptics uh, uh, with a handshake technique. Uh, again, keeping the bag and keeping the anterior hyaloid intact uh, uh, prevents uh, complications with these patients. These are very young patients. We want our technique to be very um, slick and depurated. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, we want to interfere, as I said, with the, uh, with the vitreous uh, uh, at any stage. Uh, once you exteriorize the haptics, you tuck them in the uh, tunnels that were made. And, and if you tuck him, you, uh, as you tuck him, you center uh, uh, the lens. And this I like to do. I like to place a suture close in the sclerotomies. Uh, this I do on a routine basis, especially in vitrectomized patients uh, or, or older patients. Uh, with these young patients, I like to uh, suture. I, I'll do an, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an X suture, uh, double pass suture, and that'll uh, close my, my sclerotomy and also hold the haptic uh, uh, in place, and then we'll go ahead and, and, and close our, our uh, sterile flaps, and, and, and then with uh, using Vicryl, 7 uh close the, um, the, the uh, conjunctive. And as you can see, uh, generally with this technique, if you take, make all the measurements, uh, you, you'll see that the lens is very well centered. Uh, seldomly there is tilt uh, once you aspirate it and, and see the people contract you'll find that the lens, uh, again, is very well placed and well centered. The scholastic is aspirated and, uh, and put a little bit of, of, of uh, myocol to contract the people. And I always do a, an, a peripheral iridectomy. Um, one of my uh, teachers, Professor Barraker, used to say, you never repent of doing a, a, an iridectomy. You always repent of not doing so. So the post-op management, uh, these patients, you have to follow up, follow them up uh, daily or every other day. Uh, you don't want, again, you want to control inflammation. You want to make sure that everything is fine. As I said, if you don't touch the iris and, and you do a very depurated te uh, technique, uh, the, the, then they tend to have little inflammation. Um, uh, but if you, if, you, if you let the iris to prolapse and you have to put it back in, then they tend to have a lot of inflammation and, and CDK formation. I like to use a combination of, of, of a prednisolone um, uh, acetate at 1% and a fourth generation uh, quinolone, uh, a combination of both. So it's only one drop. And I have the parents uh, place them uh, Q3 hours uh, for 15 days and then uh, slowly taper them down, um, reducing one drop uh, every week until um, they discontinue them. I also like uh, initially to prescribe uh, tropicamide Q8 hours. I want that iris to move back and forth to prevent uh, sneak formation. Remember that tropicamide has a um, uh, half-life of, uh, of eight hours. Generally, uh, you know, people will remain dilated for two or three hours and start to constrict. So we want movement of the uh, iris. Uh, and uh, tropicamine is, is a good idea. 
I don't do cyclopent late or atropine uh, because, again, they'll keep a dilation for longer periods of time. And I want the iris to move. I, I don't want it to be fixated either at eight millimeters. I just want it to move back and forth. Uh, initiate a visual rehabilitation as, uh, as soon as possible, um, either with glasses, if it's a bilateral uh, cataract and aphakia, or if it's a soft co contact lens, uh, if also aphakia or unilateral uh, cataract, it's important to, to talk to patients uh, beforehand, let them know that that's what's going to happen, because sometimes they feel that these glasses, they are plus 12s or plus 13s or plus 14s, they're very thick. So, so they feel that, you know, we did the counter, but now my, my child has these huge uh, lenses. Uh, and, 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 and so telling them beforehand, uh, prepare them to what they should expect of placing the drops, of keeping the, 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 the child with, with, with shields so they don't rub their eyes. Again, they'll have, especially if they have a vicral stitch, they'll tend to, to rub their eyes. So it's important to, to uh, again, keep them with the shields. And uh, that might be a little bit cumbersome for the parents uh, initially, but again, it aids in the uh, rehabilitation. And start uh, pre-optic uh, exercises and occlusion uh, as soon as possible, especially if it's a, a, a unilateral cataract with one to stimulate um, that uh, uh, eye uh, so it doesn't uh, become uh, amblyopic. Uh, complications, as I said, a synechia, it's a frequent complication, especially if you've manipulated the iris. Uh, so doing a, a peripheral erectomy, in my opinion, it's mandatory. Um, uh, again, it'll prevent you from, from, from having nightmares. Um, glaucoma is a, a complication uh, in, 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 in these patients, uh, especially if there's sneaky formation or uh, if there's a lot of inflammation, uh, there can be glaucoma. Uh, in my experience, um, uh, the, the only patient I can remember uh, having glaucoma um, was a child in which I did a uh, she developed anterior synechia, uh, ended up with a valve, and um, and again, uh, that uh, the prognosis is, is pretty bad. Myopia, you should account for that. They tend to become myopic over time, even if you account for um, the hyperopia or you leave them hyperopic. Uh, uh, for some reason, they, the eyes tend to grow uh, slightly longer with both thalamus, and uh, again, that's something that should be taken into account. Uh, have them uh, be seen by retina, uh, uh, especially if they're not, uh, if they're ectopia lentis. Uh, and again, account for capsular opacification. Uh, do a posterior capsulorexis uh, without rupturing the anterior hyaloid. That helps a lot, uh, preventing uh, capsular opacification. There are also uh, other approaches to prevent them. Some uh, um, uh, prefer to do uh, an anterior vitrectomy uh, because there's a rationale that the EC lenses, the EC cells could uh, proliferate up over the, the anterior hyaloid and pacify it. Uh, my experience is that it's, that it's not necessary just by rejecting the hyaloid posteriorly and doing a four to five millimeter posterior capsular rexis uh, and anterior capture. If you're going to place a lens, that'll help the leaflets to uh, bond one another and that'll prevent from the progression of, of uh, capsular uh, or anterior hyaloid uh, opacification. Uh, so in, uh, in summary, uh, management of pediatric cataracts is challenging. And I think the biggest challenge is the age of patients. Uh, again, they have a long life ahead of them and we wanna make these uh, the, the be best procedure possible uh, because of the implications they might have for their lives. Uh, uh, a very slick technique is essential, uh, working through micro incision, 1.2 millimeter incision, and using uh, micro incision forceps and instruments uh, helps a lot. Uh, and then you can you only open your main incision to implant the lens, if you're gonna implant the lens. Close up follow up is mandatory. See these patients uh, on a daily uh, basis or every other day. And a multidisciplinary approach with a strabismus specialists, neuroophthalmology specialists, generally pediatric ophthalmologists uh, will help you with that. They're they're much better prepared 
to handle the de occlusion and uh, the uh, pleoptic uh, exercises. And I think the most important is having empathy with the caregivers and parents. As I said before, let them know what to expect. Uh, give them confidence. Remember that they these generally are generally young parents that come with their children. They're very anxious because they've told them that their child has a cataract and uh, that uh, they have to have surgery at a very young age. So give them confidence that 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 you know the prognosis is very good uh, if you can do it, but that it implies a lot of effort from them and from us as uh, as um, as physicians in the visual uh, rehabilitation. And I, I'm showing this picture. There's a, uh, a baby that came to Peru to my institution who uh, had a unilateral cataract. Uh, I implanted a lens uh, in her eye and the parents gave me uh, this uh, beautiful picture of her uh, with, uh, with her name. And I keep it in my office as a reminder that we can have a huge impact in the lives of uh, these children. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm uh, open to questions uh, right now. So how to differentiate between a congenital and a developmental uh, uh, cataract? Uh, generally, again, congenital cat cataracts, uh, as I said, are referred to as uh, by the pediatrician. They're generally uh, uh, found uh, initially upon examination of, of children. Sometimes it's, it's hard to uh, identify because uh, they can be, um, uh, they could have a developmental cataract that was unnoticed at birth, but generally they compromise the, um, the uh, uh, embryonary uh, nucleus. And that is uh, how you can, you can differ differentiate it. Uh, again, uh, it's more academic to differ differentiate it because the treatment is basically the same. Sometimes I see uh, one of the patients I showed that had an embryonary cataract. I saw him at a very young age, but it was bilateral, very similar. So I know this patient, uh, if it's not too dense, will suddenly become uh, amblyopic. So we start visual rehabilitation with glasses and follow up if I see that it progresses. I see them uh, uh, every six months. And if I see that they progress, then I'll go ahead and uh, uh, remove the cataract. Uh, Would you consider simultaneous bilateral cataract uh, in, uh, in surgery? I always do, always do. All of these patients, I showed one eye, but generally if they're bilateral, I will do uh, simultaneous bilateral cataracts. The incidence of infection at our institution doing bilateral simultaneous cataract is less. Uh, it's around one in 3,000, that's 0.04%. I don't place any intracameral antibiotics. So the incidence is very low. And again, it's better to do that with children. You're gonna fix it um, uh, immediately by doing so. Um, if I didn't work where I worked, I would consider putting uh, 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 sorry, uh, Vigamox, moxifloxacin uh, in the AC, 0 0.1 millimeter. Uh, again, the reason I don't put in, in, uh, uh, intracameral antibiotics is because I think that the less that you do, the better. There's always the, the risk of TAS and TAS in, in a young children. But, but again, yeah, do bilateral cataract and prophylaxis uh, with antibiotics um, three days before surgery. I like to use gadifloxacin or, or maxifloxacin three days before surgery, four times a day to prevent uh, an infection. Um, uh, please do tell about the CTR in subacetic cataract. Uh, very good question. So uh, I try to avoid uh, uh, CTRs uh, in subluxated uh, cataracts, especially if they are either Marfan, well, Marchesani, uh, um, homocysteinuria, because the problem with these patients is that the zonule is not that it, there's a zonule rupture, it's that the zonule, the zonule is weak. And the zonule is weak 360 degrees uh, um, around the crystalline lens. So even though we might see it in a sector uh, of the, uh, 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 of the uh, of the zonule. Uh, again, the weakness is uh, uh, 
all through the zonula. So if you place a CTR to compensate for that zonular um, uh, absence, for the absence of the zonula in that place, the lens will center, but the traction on the other zonules will have the lens subluxate uh, towards that uh, area. So it's not infrequent that I've seen uh, that they that they sutured a CTR, a, a modified Cioni, a Cioni a CTR to the sclera, and then I see that the, the intractor lens is uh, luxated to the opposite side. So uh, what I would advise is against using CTR in these patients. Uh, you can use them only if you're gonna use a modified Cioni ring that you're gonna fixate uh, 180 degrees apart. So you're gonna fixate in, 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 in two sides of the uh, of the sclera uh, to center it, so that would be an option. Uh, aside from that, if you're just fixate it in one uh, place, uh, avoid it. Or if you're just just going to use uh, a regular CTR, avoid it because then you'll have that lens, that interrupted lens, uh, luxated. By fixating the lens to the sclera, you'll basically solve the problem because the lens will sit in place uh, over time. Do you do anterior vitrectomy with posterior capsulotomy? I already answered that. Uh, generally, I, I, I don't. Um, uh, I, uh, I prefer not to. If by any chance I break the anterior hyoid uh, uh, membrane and there's vitreous loss, I will do an anterior vitrectomy. Um, uh, I like to do it through the pars plana, uh, three millimeters from the limbus, and, and, and remove the vitreous uh, uh, posteriorly, and then place the lens, and then refer it to a retina specialist. Um, so, 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 so only if I have a vitreous loss. What if, but what if adding tremcillin at the end? Uh, the very, uh, very uh, good uh, um, uh, proposal. Yes, it's 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 an option. Uh, you can do it. That prevents uh, um, again inflammation uh, initially. I don't routine, do it on a routine base, basis. Uh, uh, as I said, just by by uh, using steroids and 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 other ways should be enough. But again, if you feel that it, it wasn't a very depurated technique, if it, it wasn't a very slick technique, there was uh, iris prolapse or 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 you touched the iris or there was a lot of manipulation with the iris, that is an excellent uh, option to put some some uh, tramsin alone, either in intracamerally or uh, using uh, um, uh, uh, dexamethasone uh, uh, sub, uh, and subtenance. Uh, I generally, these patients, uh, uh, I, I used to use uh, 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 Fortum and, uh, and dexamethasone uh, uh, and, and the subtenance to prevent inflammation. I don't do it anymore. Uh, I, I think that using the drops is good enough. Sorry, my question is in Spanish. Uh, it's the same question for the prevention of capsular opacification during cataract surgery. Do you use uh, tramcinolone? Uh, as I said, tramcinolone uh, is not associated for the prevention of, 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 uh, of uh, capsular opacification. Uh, it doesn't make much of a difference. Have you ever tried to push and pull technique for anterior capsular rexis? No, I've never. I, 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 I do it as, 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 as you saw it. Um, do you regularly use an AC maintainer in your uh, It's not necessary. It's not necessary. You're, uh, you, you, you don't need an AC maintainer uh, because again, you're gonna, when you do the rexis, you do it under viscoelastic. And, and when you do the aspiration, you use bimanual INA. So there's really no need for an AC uh, maintainer uh, using again a bimanual technique. Uh, it's 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 uh, it it keeps the anterior chamber uh, very stable. In patients with Marfan syndrome, how difficult is it to do capsulotomy and aspiration with the decentered lens and sound dehiscence? Uh, I showed it. It's you know you don't need to do a huge capsulorexis. The big challenge is that because there's no no zonular counter traction. Uh, again, it's very difficult. To, 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 do this, to start the rexis. Uh, uh, sometimes what I do, if, if, if I find that it's very tough to do, I'll just make a little nick with, the, with my uh, cystitone, then put a, a, um, a um, iris uh, hook. Uh, through that uh, nick, uh, 
uh, and then uh, center the lens. That'll give them a counter traction and then do a rexis. As I said, because they're very uh, soft uh, lenses, you, you just need a very small opening, a millimeter, two millimeters is enough to do the bimanual uh, aspiration. But I think that is the toughest part of doing a, uh, a, an, uh, an aspiration in a Marfan uh, syndrome. With sclerofixation technique, do you prefer to prevent anything like after years preparation of Marfan syndrome? With skull fixation technique, I showed it. The, I, I, I used the, uh, the um, uh, Agarwal uh, handshake technique uh, under skull flaps uh, by having, a, uh, my feeling is and my experience is that by having, again, a larger uh, 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 a position of the haptic over the sclera, uh, because it's a larger area that's that's placed over the sclera as you create the tunnel, uh, as opposed to uh, a, a small area that we use with the Yamani technique. Uh, again, the ten, ten, the lens tends not to tilt, and I haven't seen tilting uh, over time uh, with these patients, and they tend to be very stable, especially if you take all the measurements, two millimeters from the limbus to the sclerotomy, and and again put the create a, a good tunnel and uh, tuck the haptics so the lens is well uh, centered. Uh, do you, don't you perform, you don't perform protecting a child? No, I, I, I don't do it because I do, uh, I don't place a lens in these children. Uh, so I do uh, uh, a, a four millimeter posterior capsular axis. And the, as I said, the leaflets will, will position one against the other. So it prevent the, 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 the cells that are in the equator to migrate. Uh, they basically they they develop synechiae, uh, and 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 there's no need. Uh, if you were to put a lens uh, and you don't do a, a haptic capture, then those cells can migrate, and then you need to do uh, an anterior uh, vitrectomy. With age, the globe enlarges with star fixations on a three-piece lens and placed haptics in the tunnel. What are the chances of stretching and broken of haptics or dislocation of IOLs? Generally, as I said. Uh, I'll do this technique in older patients. Remember that the, the length of the eye will grow uh, about 95% of the growth is achieved at five, at five years of age, five to six years of age. So generally I do star fixation if patients are over six years of age. If they're under six years of age um, and it's a, it's a subluxated lens, what I'll do is I'll leave them a phagic, wait until they're around 12 or 13, and then do a sterile fixation. In case of bilateral aphakia, would you prescribe progressive glasses? Yeah, it's generally um, uh, uh, mandatory, um, uh, and, and we do, and I think they're, they're very cute looking because they're small and, 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 and very thick. Um, when do you perform anterior detective to represent anterior hyaluronic perforation of Pacific Asian children? As I said, when I place a lens uh, in very young uh, patients and when I don't do an anterior haptic uh, capture. Uh, why when implanting a good IO power, there's a high risk of myopia? Very good, good question. There's, uh, the, actually, I think there's no answer to it, but what we see is that, uh, that the eyes tend to grow uh, is it because we touched them? Is it because they had surgery? But they tend to to increase in length over time, more so than what's uh, expected. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think there's 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 really no um, uh, um, reason to 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 see it. Could it be compensation? Could be uh, an evolutionary process of the eye trying to, to compensate for the lack uh, of reading because we've left them hyperopic? Honestly, I don't have an answer for that question. Um, thank you very much for uh, inspiring the future. What's your, oh, what's your opinion on EDOF or multifocal IOLs and pediatric cataracts? So I think the jury is still out. Uh, I, I've done multifocal. I did it on a, on a tennis player. He wasn't so young, uh, but I did a restore plus 2.5 back then when it was available. Now I've had a lot of experience with eat off lenses and I think it's a better option because they behave like the monofocal, but uh, give some, some reading and, and decreases the dependence on, on lenses. Um, uh, multifocals, I'm not 
very, uh, uh, you know, very excited about them because remember the multifocals uh, basically divide light at 50% for distance. The modern ones, 50, 20, 20, and they lose about 10%. And you want to re rehabilitate this patient. So I'm not sure if that has an implication with, uh, with, uh, uh, and and the opia and 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 the the the, uh, the, the treatment for amblyopia. Uh, thank you for answering the lec uh, lecture. Please, is there a particular reason patients that have glaucoma, Pascari surgery? And again, the, the 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 study I told you found that a higher incidence of glaucoma and um, and um, uh, retinal detachment and complications when we place an intraocular lens. Really enough that when they analyzed pa uh, patients that were left aphantic, the those uh, complications um, were lower. So maybe it's because it's lens-associated complications, formation of synechiae. When we place a lens, we want to do a hop to capture. We want to we do a posterior uh, rexis. Uh, so could be that related? Um, yes, I don't know. But, uh, but I'm not a glaucoma specialist. Uh, I, I, I just... Uh, I've seen I've seen it as I said only one my, one of my patients uh, that developed glaucoma but she had uh, complications she had vitreous loss and uh, and uh, and and you know everything uh, came uh, uh, down the mountain after that but uh, um, uh, you mentioned glaucoma complication which one yeah it's it's generally it's uh, angle closure glaucoma uh, there's some patients with uh, open uh, um, uh, angle glaucoma. How do you manage lateral unilateral microphthalmos with cataract? So that is one of the most complex cases because the prognosis is really, really bad. So I've, uh, 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 you know, uh, you'll need in these patients, uh, you'll need about a plus 50 diopter lens. Uh, uh, leaving them a fake is not an option because they'll end up plus 20 or plus 30. So. These patients, I tend to tell tell parents that uh, you know their the prognosis is very bad. Uh, doing surgery will, might have more complications than benefits, and I try to uh, to uh, dissuade them from from doing cataract surgery. Do you use CDR ring for subluxation lens? I answered this question already. What type uh, of IOL do you use in children? Generally, I use and that is a very good question. I use a monofocal uh, uh, lens. Uh, uh, I like the uh, Technis ZCB00 lens. The reason I like it is because it is a very high quality lens. It's a, a large, uh, a, a thicker lens because of lower index of refraction. It compensates for um, uh, chromatic aberration, having a, a higher Abbey number. So the optical quality is very good and doesn't develop glistenings over time. So it's my preferred lens. And nowadays I'm, I'm using the iHands lens, which is a monofocal plus. And I've used the Symphony lens, which is a, an EDOF. I think the Vivity, which also an EDOF, could be a good lens. And now the Clarion that has um, uh, less glistenings and a better op uh, optical quality um, yeah, is best. Uh, uh, here's another question that I think it's a very interesting. When do you perform primary capsulotomy? Um, uh, I responded, I'll do a, 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 an intraoperative capsule uh, uh, in, in most patients. If they're older than four years old and I, I think I can do a, a laser capsulotomy, I'll, I, I won't do it as I showed. And then within a month after surgery, I'll do a laser capsulotomy because generally patients uh, collaborate uh, to do them. Uh, do you do anterior detectory? Uh, answered already that, that question. Do you feel some congenital subtainous steroids at the end of surgery? Yes, I used them initially uh, a lot. Now I've, I, I only use the drops. Uh, but again, it's if it's not a bad idea to use them, it'll prevent uh, um, synechiae and inflammation. Uh, so, as an optometrist, how do you contribute to the patient management? I re we work in my where I work. We work with optometrists and we work with uh, with uh, uh, pediatric ophthalmologists. So we're a multidisciplinary practice. So generally, they're they're amazing. I, they're the ones that fit the lens. They're the one, the, the soft contact lens, they're the one that prescribe the glasses. So again, we work together to, to, to make sure that the visual rehabilitation is done uh, in an adequate uh, manner. What would the IOL power 
uh, sort of dog that answer that. What would the owl power in planet a three-year-old be with a, a dropper biometry of uh, 33 uh, diopters? So generally, if, if the lens of the, the patient needs is uh, 33, I showed you a table, we need to leave them hyperopic at around uh, three diopters. But the problem is that we, uh, Alton has lenses that go up to 40 diopters of power, the SA60 lens, uh, not the SN60, the SA60, which they're, where they're stopping production, which that will be a problem, but they have powers that go up to 40. Uh, the SN60 lens uh, goes, and the Clarin lens goes up to uh, 34 diopters in power. So uh, again, you would have to uh, juggle in what you want them to leave. Again, seeking for emetropia in these children, sometimes it's, it, it, it's not that such a good idea. You know, you, you have to work with what you have. So in, in that patient, I wouldn't plan probably a 40, uh, yeah, the, the, the 38 or 40 diopter uh, lens if I, I could uh, uh, have it uh, available. If not, I would implant the maximum positive lens that I could find. When do you do PI for all patients? I do uh, PI for all patients. I already answered that. Uh, it's a good idea. You never repent of doing it. So you do repent of not doing so. Uh, do you do cataract surgery in both eyes? Uh, yes, uh, simultaneously. I, I'll do them on both eyes. Uh, do you insert IOL to your old child? Uh, yes, generally I start after, after 12 months to implant uh, uh, lenses. I did it after six months, once uh, speaking to a pediatric ophthalmologist at Manhattan Nine Year, where I did my, my fellowship training. Uh, I, I, I was invited to, to give a lecture to a visiting professor. And I went to the OR and I met Dr. Meadows, who was a, was a, a pediatric ophthalmologist at, at me, or was, uh, I don't know, he still practices. And he said that he was implanting lenses uh, for children uh, over six months of age. So when I came back, uh, to the barracker, I, I decided that I was going to try that, and I did it, but I wasn't, I wasn't very successful. I think that the patient that had the glaucoma, I implanted the lens, and she was like a seven or, or eight-month-old uh, baby, and then I had another one, which I did a posterior optic capsule, and the lens shipped it, and I had to bring her back in and replace it and do an anterior optic capture, so I I went away of doing it in, in children younger than, than, uh, than 12 months of age. Uh, how do you operate children with a, that, that is the biggest challenge. Uh, persistent hypertrophic uh, primary vitreous um, is, uh, is, is a challenge because what happens with, with those patients is that there's the, uh, the uh, hy hyaluronic artery is still persistent. Uh, and it becomes fibrotic, so it never it never regresses. So when you go into do the cataract, what you find is the lens is clear, but what's really a fibrotic uh, is the is the, the the posterior capsule, which has part of the tunica vasculosa lentis in place. So you have to go in with scissors and cut it because not the the vitrector doesn't work. And then you have to do an anterior vitrectomy and cut that strand of, of, uh, of hyaluroid, hyaluroid artery that is persistent. I've done two or three of those, and I think they are very, very, very challenging. The prognosis is not good. Generally, you tend not to implant an intraocular lens, so it is probably one of the toughest. It helps him aesthetically, and you have to refer them to a retina specialist immediately after surgery, make sure that, that the retina is fine. Do you give systemic steroids? No, the answer is no, only topical. Great talk, thanks. When do you prefer to implant uh, IL in children after cataract surgery? I already responded to that after 12 months of age. What is the rate of visual access opacification? Very high. If you don't do a pseudorexis, if you don't do optic capture, if you don't do anterior vitrectomy, all of these patients uh, uh, are changing with them. Have I you done IL exchange in child with myopic shift? The answer is no. Um, these lenses tend to, if the lens is in the sulcus, I would with, uh, with uh, 
um, no problem. I would do a, a, a change. I haven't done so, but if the lens in the sulcus, it's very easy to exchange. I've changed. I've exchanged lenses in the sulcus for you know old, older patients, uh, many many years after implantation. Uh, they're generally three piece, and they're quite easy to explain. But if they're a uh, single piece in the bag, they become you know very fibrotic where the haptics are. So if I were to do it, I would have to be able to remove it, cut, cut the haptics and leave them in the bag and then place a uh, three-piece uh, IOL in the, in the sulcus. The other option would be uh, placing a, um, an add-on lens in the sulcus uh, to compensate for myopia, the, the myopic shift. The problem is that they go uh, to, from plus five to minus uh, five. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, I don't understand. It's uh, in uh, uh, a language I don't understand. So in the future, if a patient has had the procedure visits, like right what do you look for as an optometrist? Thank you. A look at the reflexes. Very good questions. Look at the reflexes. Uh, if you see that the reflexes are not nice and clear when you're doing the refraction, uh, you should refer them to uh, a retina specialist. And, uh, and if a patient had the procedure, again, refracting is tough. Generally, auto refractors make it easier, but you know, don't go away from, from, from uh, the, uh, the refraction, um, manual refraction. Uh, you should be able to prescribe uh, good lenses. Why do patients after taking surgery often have postoperative uveitis and there's a way to fix it? Uh, as I said, children are very uh, pro-inflammatory. Remember that their immune system is very strong, um, very new, uh, I'd like to say. So uh, that is the reason why we tend not to do penetrating keratoplasties in children because they have a high rate of rejection. So their iris is very pro-inflammatory uh, uh, and breaking the the, uh, the um, uh, aqueous barrier uh, due to manipulation, it favors uh, development of inflammation. So that is the reason that uh, they, they are the, the very inflammatory. And the reason to fix it is using subconjunctival steroids or using tramsinolone in the AC or using high frequency steroids, uh, very potent steroids like prednisolone um, very frequently in the, uh, uh, the post-op. So that is uh, how uh, I manage it. Uh, again, thank you very much for participating. And um, um, again, I think this presentation will be in CyberSight so you can, you can access it whenever you want. And thanks a lot to Andy and uh, Chang and to Lauren Sika for all of your help and for having me here today.